Good morning, everyone, and welcome to, from the West Coast, our G Plus Hangout with Payscale and Millennial Branding about the Gen Y generation at work. Thank you for joining us. My name is Bridget Quigg. I'm going to be your host today. And with me are two very brilliant, interesting people. We have Dan Schauble. He is the founder and leader of Millennial Branding, which is a consulting firm. He's been branded by New York Times as the personal branding guru. Um, he's written an international best-selling book. He is a public in Times and Forbes on a regular basis as a columnist, as well as having been published in a number of other magazines such as Elle and Wired. Um, you'll find him everywhere you find discussions about Gen Y. And then from Payscale, we have Katie Bardaro. She is the lead economist and an analytics manager here at Payscale. Katie has a great academic history in the world of economics. She was at one point student teacher of the year at University of Washington's uh, economics department, she, where she got her master's degree. Katie has been instrumental in promoting Payscale's data by making it uh, interesting and excellent and accurate on every front in our public relations efforts, such as today's Hangout. So thank you all for being here. We're going to um, be taking questions throughout the Hangout. We have a few of our own to get us started today. but. If you have anything you'd like to hear about from Dan or Katie, just write us. All right, so our first question this morning uh, is pretty simple, and it's to, we'll start with Dan. How do you define Gen Y, age range, et cetera? Tell us a bit about them. Sure. 18 to 29-year-olds, born 1982 to 1993, uh, wired generation, uh, much different than the old, older generation, so we're talking Gen X and, and the baby boomers, and then there's the younger generation, Gen Z, which is, uh, these are really young teenagers and uh, beneath that at this point. And so Gen Y, you know, highly adept in technology, always carrying on the mobile phone, of course. Uh, they're going to be 50% of the workplace in a, a couple of years. By 2025, they're going to be 75% of the workplace, so they're on, they're on taking over. But uh, at the same time, they're very unemployed. So they, they suffered through uh, all the economic turmoil and are still suffering. And that's a lot of what we covered in this study uh, that we're going to be discussing today, sadly. <laughs> all right. That's a good point. That's a good lead into Katie. Katie, um, you just uh, led a study along, co branded with Millennial Branding, about Generation Y called Gen Y on the Job on behalf of Payscale. Um, but go ahead and answer that first question, if you would, and you can use reference from the study. But how do you define Gen Y? I think the age range will probably be the same. And from an economic standpoint, uh, tell us a bit about them. Similar to what Dan said, 18 to 29 year olds, you know, the age range is a little fluctuating. Sometimes it goes as far as 1977 as the starting year, sometimes as early as 1987. So I would say, in general, it's kind of defined more by a mentality than an actual age range. It's a very wired generation. They've lived their whole life in the public sphere, always had internet, mobile phones, technology to make their lives easier and sometimes more complicated. And they're also suffering with huge levels of unemployment and underemployment. You know, graduating college the wrong time, essentially, getting nowhere fast, unfortunately. Yeah, just, just something to add. I, I think it's important to know that, you know, they were promised that a degree would turn into, you know, a full-time job. They were promised that internships would turn into jobs. There's like, so they're living in the world of broken promises. They don't really trust politicians and the way things work right now. Um, and, and basically very entrepreneurial organization, uh, a generation individuals that don't be that believe that they have to guide their own careers and not wait for other people to just take care of them. Right. I, I would jump in too and say that Gen Y has no company loyalty. They, they have, have the, the they don't, they don't have, have that same feeling that the older generation has where, you know, they stick with a company for their life hoping for a pension. You know, Gen Y knows that that is just not real a real thing to believe in. So there's no company loyalty with Gen Y. They're more out there for themselves and to make themselves successful than to make their company successful. Yeah, adding on to that, I mean, they're expected to have nine different jobs between the ages of 18 and 34. And they leave their first job, this was found in our study, in, in two years, but we found in January it's a little over two years. And then other studies, is two, two years is like the magic number when they leave. But they want to, here's what's interesting, is they do want to stay a little bit longer, so about 4.8 years. Mm -hmm. But this lack of career opportunities, that's, that's their biggest complaint.
Okay. Sorry, everyone. I'm back now. Um, I was just saying great information from both Katie and Dan and uh, very much in line with what the Gen Y on the Job report from uh, Payscale and Millennial Branding found. Uh, this is an unemployed, underemployed, very well educated generation. And the, you both started to answer the next question, but I'm going to pose it to you anyways. Tell us more about what this means for Generation Y and for the economy. I think I'm curious about their role in today's economy as this very entrepreneurial group that you've just described. I mean, people are saying generation screwed, generation jobless. They, you know, they're not overall in the economy. They're not buying homes. They're postponing major life events like marriage. Uh, you know, when they graduate, they're moving back with their parents. And they're not driving cars. They're trying to move to cities so they don't have cars. So it's like a lot of different things going on. And uh, I think one of the big findings that we've had, at least the lead in finding, was that over 60% uh, have bachelor degrees, but that's not really amounting to a, a, a full-length career path. It's more of a, a retail jobs. So I think that was one of the, the big findings that we have is, you know, you're, you have to get a bachelor degree in order to compete, but now that you have your bachelor degree, you can't even get the job you want sometimes. So I thought that was really interesting. Katie, if you would answer the question about them and the economy, especially from an economics perspective. Sure. From an uh, economics perspective, the real harm that we're seeing from Gen Y being underemployed is it's really kind of halting innovation in a lot of ways. We're not getting the new, young, fresh minds who have a lot of experience with technology, a lot of education, a lot of skills, and just no opportunities to use any of those things. So companies are not moving as fast or, or innovating as fast as they could be with all this new, fresh talent, unfortunately. Um, one thing I will say is there's somewhat of a, a dichotomy in Gen Y. There is one side that is is going into engineering, you know, computer science, they're finding jobs, they're getting hired fresh out of school, you know, because some of the those companies who are known for being innovative, such as Google or, you know, Facebook or any of those big IT giants, they want these young fresh minds to come in and shape their product and make them more attractive and just grow faster in terms of their reach. But then there's the other people who are majoring in things that used to be very successful, you know, business, economics, there's the humanities, any of those kind of majors, those are the people who are really being hurt by the current economy. They're, you know, working in retailers, baristas, or customer service reps, anything they can do to find work because they can't find the job that actually utilizes their skills or their education. Yeah, and I think this is where it gets really interesting because you think, oh, if they can't find a job, they'll just you know, just keep searching for a job, maybe live with their parents, but what they need to do is pay back loans too, and there's like, it's like billions of student loans. I mean, I don't know, I have written the number somewhere, but it's a lot, I mean, it's a really high number, and they're suffering from that, so they have to do the retail jobs, not just to buy themselves time in order to search for a professional job, but because they have to pay back student loans, so they're in a huge, huge bind with all of that right now. The other thing I would say is that another thing we're seeing is more and more people are going back to get higher levels of education because they can't find jobs. And you also have the win that if you have a government loan, you can defer your interest payments and your payments on it if you're still enrolled in school. So a lot of people are going on to get their master's or their doctorate or maybe an MD, various degrees that they're hoping will then get them a job, but it's just not been the case. There's people now, you know, kind of on the tail end of Gen Y or maybe the Gen Y, Gen X uh, cusp that are graduating with these higher degrees thinking, okay, now I'm set. Now I'm above my peers. Now I'll get a job and it's still not true for them. Wow. Sounds basically, like it is. Basically oh, the, the system's broken. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that, right. That's the main message here and and that and that, that you know it's all about figuring out what solutions that, that we have mm -hmm. for Gen Y and, and how they can kind of fight fight in this economy until hopefully it's revived. Did you want to say something about that, Dan? Yeah, I think I think uh, you know that the fact that they're very entrepreneurial is one path to creating your own income. You know, doing freelance jobs and and possibly starting a company. I think they're it's tough though. I mean, it's it's not for everyone. Banks aren't loaning. You know, to get an investor to invest in you is tough. I mean, most small companies, uh, if you look at the statistics, it's all you know funded by the person or their family. Um, for friends, and that doesn't always happen because they're suffering too. So it's just like this whole—it's this huge bind that ever, everyone's in right now. Um, so that's that's why a lot of people are trying to do more freelance jobs and retail jobs, just have some money to, to buy them time 
in order to get more of a job that they want. But a lot of people are settling still. A lot of people, you know, I was talking to some uh, people who graduated my school and they're, they have temp jobs and temp jobs, this is, temp agencies are exploding right now, but these are jobs that you're looking at just a few weeks uh, of, and then you're out and then what? That's not going to, mostly that, that doesn't turn into jobs and even internships don't really turn into jobs and so it's just, it's just, uh, it's a tough scene right now. So, so let's sell Gen Y to employers here a little bit. So mm -hmm. we talked a lot about who they are, um, but let's talk about positive and negative attributes of this generation. We talked how they're tech savvy, they can be entrepreneurial if they need to be, but comes down to nuts and bolts and employers looking to hire someone. What is great about Gen Y? And then what are some of the challenges that employers need to be aware of if they're hiring this generation? Uh, how can they maximize on them? Uh, Katie, why don't you take this one first? Yeah. I would say that Gen Y has this negative stigma that they are entitled, they're spoiled, they, you know, they'll only take a job if they can be promised lots of flexibility in terms of their social media use or flexible hours, if they can roll out of bed at 11. And, and well, you know, there are definitely people like that. There's people like that in every generation. I don't think it should be what defines Gen Y because, like Dan and I have been saying, they are incredibly innovative. They're very entrepreneurial. They have all of these great tech-savvy skills. You know, things that people, act, older people, older generations actually had to spend numerous years or numerous years of education or certifications to get to this level of, of technology knowledge that Gen Y just has it because they've always had it and they've always used it. It's not something scary or intimidating to them. It's it's how they embrace their life. So, you know, as a technology driven society, then we should be embracing these workers because they will take us further and farther than anything. So, you know, Gen Y might have a little bit of a negative lean towards them for this entitled idea, but it's just not always true. And the, I think the key thing to remember if, if you're a Gen Y person is you don't want to perpetuate that stereotype. You know, when you're on an interview with a company, don't ask about social media policies in your first interview. Don't ask if you can come in at 11. Don't, you know, don't ask those kind of questions as you're in a job interview because people are already probably thinking that when they're talking to you. Yeah, just to add on to that, Cisco did a technology report they released in 2011 and more than half of students and recent graduates would not not uh, accept a job that banned or not work at a company that banned social network and use and didn't let them choose their own mobile device. And choosing your own mobile device is usually the iPhone. I mean, that's really what that says. No one wants to use Blackberries. It's not cool. Um, so just adding on to this, I think in terms of what we're going to see in corporate America just by, by conversations and by what companies are starting to do is they're kind of like reformatting the organization so it's more of it's more of like a, a Google, right? It's a, and this is not every company, of course, but more of a startup. Uh, uh, companies are starting. To, big companies are starting to resemble more like startups. So startup culture within big companies, because the way millennials see the workplace is not. They don't really go around saying, you know, I work for Google. It's more of mentally. It's more of I work on this team on these projects. That's what they see every day. So that's kind of how they work. And they're big on collaboration. Um, they're big multitaskers. Uh, they want feedback constantly. And so we look at the organizations now. I mean, I worked for EMC, big tech co technology company, for three and a half years. It was all about the annual performance review. Now it's not, I think that's going to die out and it's going to be more of just like continuous uh, reviews and, um, and feedback because that's what millennials, millennials want. So that's going to be a huge change. And then hierarchies, I think it's going to become more flat. I think you're going to see more millennials. Uh, force companies to allow them to work uh, and telecommute and work from home or wherever they want as long as the job gets done. I mean, it goes back to um, uh, the, the old uh, term, R-O-E, R-O-W-E, results only, results only workplace environment. So, so it's like a concept, I think it was done uh, by Best Buy, still done by Best Buy like a 10 years ago, where it's just about getting the work done. It's not about where you're doing it and who you're doing with. Just get it done. And so I think that's where it's going to be. I ca kind of call it ROI Nation now. It's just, just, you know, as long as you can prove results, you'll have a good career in a sense, right? It's less about the fluffiness. It's less about, you know, work nine to five and then go home and be with the, your children and your dog. It's more about you're just kind of like always working around the clock. Uh, that's the big changeover is that because companies, it's kind of like a new employment contract that's happening. So because companies expect employees to do kind of answering emails and having phone calls with different countries outside of work when they go home, 
they're allowed to have more personal time at work, and that's kind of shifting the way work gets done and how and where it gets done. All right. I'm going to get that mute button figured out. Um, so the point I was making, Dan, was that your comments about the workplace and the workplace schedule and just how work fits into people's lives is bound to change as uh, Gen Y becomes more dominant or predominant in the workplace. How do you think actual physical workspaces might change um, going forward compared to, I mean, maybe describe what you see right now as a more traditional workspace and how you think it might change. And we'll start with Dan and then Katie will go to you. Yeah, so I was at American Express, their headquarters uh, in New York the other week, and they're already companies are already testing out new workplace uh, work environments and how they set everything up. So like a company like that will have a few floors where they test it out to see how it works and see how it affects productivity. Uh, and it's very casual. Like it's when I walked into you know the Google headquarters, very casual. It's like you know there's like a lounge there. There's like you know soda machines. There's like ping pong. Like it's it's like a startup culture within a big company that's that's what we're gonna start to see and I think it's good I think it'll I think it's a great marketing tool for Gen Y I think that they're gonna have to you know be really uh, upfront about exactly what it's gonna be like I think that a lot of companies are gonna start using video and pictures and other ways to show exactly what they're getting before they sign up for it as in before you apply you see kind of exactly what you're getting in terms of a workplace and and who you're gonna be working with and the type of position and and all of that type of information so I think it's all going to close that that part, the employer branding piece online through social networks, it'll close that gap. And I think that when when you look at the companies who are testing this right now, they're having more of an upswing in recruiting and an upswing in uh, engagement and productivity because these are how Gen Wires best work. And so if you give kind of give them what they want, then they'll be, they'll be it'll just adopt it and it'll be easier. And it, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, I don't know if you saw, it was a really, really big article on how uh, you know, you have some companies that are really changing everything in order to cater to Gen, Gen Y. So, like this one company I read about, uh, they guarantee a promotion after a year, guaranteed, unless like you really screw up. I mean, guaranteed. And so, the, a lot of companies are starting to, especially like you know, mid-sized companies. The biggest companies haven't really done it yet, but like completely change their policies in favor of young workers in order to trap them. And and uh, the results in that article it speaks for themselves. Like it's. You know, the retention rate is 85% at some of those companies now for Gen Y. And it was low. It was like 25% before. Katie, did you want to address the workplace? Sure. So, similar to what Dan said, is uh, there's a, a big feeling about collaboration in Gen Y. Gen Y likes to work together. and one of the things that companies are doing is they're starting to kind of uh, deconstruct cubes and get rid of offices and kind of have more open floor spaces, more desks that are clustered, so people can just very easily work collaboratively with their peers. And I think that is a something that physically is actually happening. You know, and similar, we've seen, you know, we're in the startup world, so we know are familiar with lots of startups and what startups are doing. And, you know, we have a ping pong table and we have parties um, and we have various little trophies to reward people for doing well because everyone knows Gen Y likes their trophies and it, we do all these various things to kind of reward them and make them feel valuable to the company because that's the key thing is Gen Y wants to feel valued. They want to feel like their um, their voice matters, that they're contributing something, that they're just not another cog in the machine. So when companies do that, those various little things for recognition, even if it's really something simple like sending out an email like, oh, so-and-so did really well on this project, let's go grab a beer after work, you know, that's the kind of stuff that Gen Y loves. And also, like Dan said, a, a results-oriented work environment, I think it was ROWE, is so true. I mean, whether someone comes into work, doesn't come into work till 11 and then leaves at 7, it doesn't really matter as long as what they're doing is results. and. So I think that's such a great acronym. Thank you, Katie. Um, we have some questions coming in, and uh, we talked about changing the workplace. Dan has brought up a number of times this idea of entrepreneurship, and as a way out of the the 
difficulty of finding a job. I think it's fascinating and he also brought up that some people are not well wired for it. So this is sort of a two-part question. Um, Katie, I'm going to start with you on it. I'm sure Dan will have some plenty to, to throw in, but uh, the question that came is, what are some good resources for Gen Y in terms of entrepreneurial pursuits? And if you would, you study the skills of, uh, in Gen Y certifications. People have different abilities. What do, you, what do you think that's very realistic advice across a wide swath of workers or what advice would you give to maybe the Gen Yers who are a little nervous about that possibility? Um, I don't know if that's too complicated of a question. Do you, do you see that? So what are some resources in general and then do you have advice for people who find that thought quite intimidating? So similar to what Dan said, uh, not everyone has the entrepreneurial spirit and you have to be a go-getter, real hardworking, kind of nose to the grindstone type person to get your entrepreneurial effort to kind of lift off. And some of the skills that attribute to it are definitely anything to do with social media or branding or, or some, market, some marketing skills, some things that can take your idea and make it attractive to the overall set of people. Uh, in addition to that, I would say you have to be a great communicator. Uh, there's no way that you could get something lifted off the ground if you can't communicate it well. So, you know, communication skills, marketing skills, branding skills, social media, I'll just reiterate, I think those are kind of the real skills you need to be successful at entrepreneurialism. But um, I think Dan has a lot of really great ideas about entrepreneurialism, so I'll let him contribute. Yeah, I mean, if you're good in sales, you can basically do anything in this current work environment because if you can walk to a company and say, hey, tomorrow I can bring in three new clients, you're hired. You can basically create your own job at that company if you can bring money into that company. Uh, you know, the first people that get fired is human resources and then marketing, right? But sales, I mean, especially at some companies, sales, you can just walk in there and say, you know, I can grow, you know, revenue by 250% and look at what I did for this last company or look what I've done this for myself and my consulting business. I mean, it's just so much easier to walk in. Um, what's harder is more of HR type roles where where it's harder to prove ROI. So again, goes back to ROI Nation. Goes uh, starting a business, same thing. You know, to get investors on board, you have to be able to do it yourself before other people. You have to already be. It's very interesting. It's like I, I do. Uh, I'm in the publishing world too, and you have to be able to sell your book before other people will want to help you sell it. So it's kind of like a be successful, and then other people will jump on board. Um, but if you have a blank resume. You know, if you've never done it before, it can be hard. So again, you know, going to resources, reading as much as possible, you know, reading TechCrunch, Mashable, uh, YEC.org, um, you know, Kauffman Foundation's good, um, StartupNation.com is good, Entrepreneur Magazine, Inc. Magazine. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there. A lot of them are free too. Uh, but in a sense, you know, the way I got into entrepreneurship is I started a blog. I think a blog is a good stepping stone because you just get your ideas out there. You see other people who are interested in your ideas. And then as you kind of build that, it kind of it can um, it can help you think of an idea for a business, or you can turn the blog somehow into a business. It's obviously harder now to monetize a blog, but the blog can be a stepping stone. So from the blog, I launched a magazine and consulting business and speaking business, a book, and all this other stuff. But I started with the blog, and the blog kind of uh, gave me an outlet to get my ideas out. And I think that uh, since the cost of a blog is it's free, you know, it's just your labor. Um, I think it's one stepping stone to getting in the position where you can start a, a small business is to do something like that. And freelancing, you know, there's Odesk, there's there's uh, Freelancer.com, there's, there's several other uh, freelance job boards, and uh, you're, you're just typically competing get for projects. But you know, you get a few projects done, you build the portfolio, you put that online, you can start marketing yourself. I mean, the key right now in terms of the overall economy and, and getting jobs and, and uh, you know creating your own job and build, being an entrepreneur, or whatever you want to do is you need a really strong online presence because it's much easier when people find out about you and then contact you for different opportunities rather than you blindly reach out to everyone. Dan, that was a fabulous list of information. We should we should write that all down and get it out to the to the crew in a, in a well, we shouldn't put it on paper. We'll put it on some groovy digital <laughs> format. But uh, what a great list. And for those of you who don't know, YEC, Dan, remind us what YEC stands for. Yeah, so founded by uh, two of my friends, Scott Gerber and Ryan Pa, and basically it's an invite-only uh, group of entrepreneurs. I think they have a few hundred people at this point, uh, maybe like 600 people. But like they provide constant uh, information from, so these entrepreneurs, these 600 entrepreneurs, top companies, 
they provide free information through their website yec.org and it's you know, Young Entrepreneurs everything. Council, I believe. Is that right? Yep. I just, so I just wanted people to know. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah. it's you know it's it's free content from entrepreneurs on how to get investors and how to build a brand and anything head to toe. But you 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 know you can find similar information on Inc and all that as well. But this is coming directly from the entrepreneur's mouth. So it's like uh, you know getting a teach you know getting a, t a teacher who's never you know had a job besides teaching or get you know. Getting in an entrepreneur class taught by a successful entrepreneur—it's it's a whole different ballgame, in my opinion. Gotcha. Very good. Good resources. Uh, another question came in about um, this idea that there's a stigma around Gen Y. I mean, what you two just described with an entrepreneur—the scrappy, the go-getter—that is not the reputation Gen Y has had, in particular, um, as a generation. Uh, they're actually considered by many to be lazy, spoiled. What, Kate, you started to talk about some of this and your uh, advice for people going into an interview, but do you have any more advice for Gen Y on how to not be perceived as lazy, how to break through that stigma, uh, whether it's in an interview or um, any sort of interaction they have with a potential employer or client? Katie? Uh, I would say that the key thing is you have to present yourself well and you have to make sure that the employer understands that you are there to kind of be innovative and make the company successful by doing your job well. And so the best way to sell yourself is to talk about your skills, you know, do the usual job interview stuff. But like I said, don't don't bring up any of the things that Gen Y is stereotypically known for caring about. Even if it is something you care about, you know, discuss that more in later interviews. Don't bring it up in your first interview. If it's really key to you accepting a job, then yeah, you should discuss it. But people are already thinking when they're interviewing Gen Y, like, oh, this person just wants to look at Facebook all the time. They want to tweet about whatever lunch they had. They, you know, they want to roll out of bed and work whenever they want to work. They, they almost need to be introduced to what Dan was calling the ROWE, the results-oriented work environment, because it is true that Gen Y might kind of want different hours or the ability to work from home or a little bit more flexibility. That's a key thing we saw in our study is Gen Y really cares about flexibility. Um, and that's, doesn't, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And it doesn't make them lazy and it doesn't make them entitled or spoiled. It's just how they get their work done. And if you're an employer on the employer side, if all you should be caring about is whether the work is being done and whether it's being done well, then it shouldn't really matter how you get there from A to B. Yeah, I think it's just the thing with work is it is so complicated. You know, business is a science for a reason, right? You, you're dealing with people. You have to be able to read people in situations. You have to understand the company, what you can and can't get away with, their policies. Um, you know, I think it's part of the reason why we see such a surge in, in young people working for smaller companies as opposed to larger companies that, that was in the study. Um, because it's 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 a much easier environment to get into, right? You can, you're trusted with a lot more in smaller companies because there's only there could only be five employees or twenty employees. Uh, larger companies, it's you're doing this, this other person is doing that. I mean, I went through all of that, um, so it's a little bit more complicated. Even though you know there's a lot more money, there's a lot there's a lot more more resources involved. Uh, it's still a young person who wants to get their hands in several different things, and so that's why that's part of the reason why. Plus, obviously, a startup, you know, very flexible work hours, just get the work job done. But you're going to be working seven days a week. Big corporate job, typically not working seven days a week, typically forty to sixty hours. So, um, you know, it's a give and take. Startups, you're probably making less money than you know, maybe an accounting job at a Fortune 500 company, and so. It's a given. It's a give and take, and and what's interesting about Gen Y is it's not just about you know, older generations is a little bit more about you know get getting paid more or uh, what title you have in the company. For Gen Y, it's they put a lot of things above getting paid more. You know, flexibility. I just got a study today. Flexibility. They care about more than getting paid more. They. Uh, they look at a corporation, and if a corporation is just about profit, they're not interested. They'd rather have a corporation that's giving back to the community, and so it's 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 they look at corporations differently, and and that's why I think they're just going to change corporate America in the next ten years, is because they have a different set of values. They're looking, they think of business differently, or think business should uh, be different in a sense. All right. Um, well, that is some radical thinking. That'll be interesting to see what the next decades bring with Gen Y on the job. Uh, we have one last question we got from those listening today, and it is, how can you teach 
what can you teach managers about how to manage Gen Y effectively? What would you be your advice to someone who has a Gen Y employee? Dan, why don't we go to you? Sure. I think I think one of the really important things that's or often overlooked is transparency, being open and honest about what's really going on in the company, not hiding everything. Uh, because Gen Y, I mean, if you look at the online world, they're very transparent. They just they they if someone lies to them, they'll figure it out. I mean, you just can't get away with anything anymore. And in companies, it's the same thing. It's you know, let them be involved in certain discussions. Don't keep them out. Let them, you know, because these companies, it's all about succession planning right now. I mean, it's going to be such a, you know, baby boomers are not going to be in the workforce for another 20 years. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Even though they're delaying retirement, it's just, they're not going to work, you know, at 80 or 90 years old. I mean, my grandfather, he worked, the, you know, till probably like 70 something. But, I mean, it just doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. So, succession planning is huge. And, and when they're looking at the next generation of leaders, they, they have to do things differently if they want to keep them and, and bring them into, um, you know, bring them into the internal recruiting programs. And that's another big thing is internal recruiting programs. What we're going to see in the future, sadly, is that if you don't already have a job, it's going to be so much harder to get a job because more companies are just going to recruit from within. It's cheaper and uh, builds morale and several other things. Um, but for for young people, it's about it's about how do I choose a company that I know I can grow with. They're looking for high growth companies. They're looking for the tech companies that, that we showed in the study. They're looking for, you know, the fast paced culture, the one the the culture where they can make a huge impact in a short period of time. They're not willing to wait ten years to work on a big project. Um, so I think in a way they need to be set up for success and not failure. And I think a lot of companies are not uh, they don't create an atmosphere where Gen Y can be successful because they don't really understand Gen Y. Katie? Uh, I would agree with a lot of what Dan was saying. The other thing I would say is on top of just knowing what's going on in the company, you have to be really open with the Gen Y employee about how you feel about them and their work. Give them feedback, whether it be negative or positive. You know, Gen Y, they want to feel like people value what they're doing, and if they're not doing something right, they want to know and they want to improve upon it. You know, Gen Y definitely has a strong feeling of wanting to be successful in their career, and the best way to do that is with feedback from the people who are around them. So that is key. The other thing I would say is that uh, managers have to understand that Gen Y might not communicate in the same way that older generations do. You know, Gen Y is definitely a very more text-focused, email-focused, blogging-focused communicator than a long phone call focus. So, um, and to do things effectively, sometimes it might be better to have uh, conversations over a chat client, or it might be easier over email than then just sit and have a long conference call. That is one thing I would definitely think. Uh, the other thing I would say is that if you, as Dan was saying earlier, and as we've shown in the study, that Gen Y doesn't have company loyalty, they don't stay with companies, and as everyone knows, it's expensive to hire and train a new employee. And even though there's a large pool of Gen Y employees out there, and there's a large talent pool that definitely could be tapped into, it doesn't help if you're losing the people who are working for you because you're not a good company for Gen Y. So there's definitely things the company overall could do, you, you know, change their physical workplace to make it more uh, open for collaboration, offer some sort of incentives, and, and it can be non-compensation incentives because Gen Y isn't all about money. It could be things like, oh, every, you know, one Friday a month, everyone's going to go out to happy hour, or it could be something even more simple like, oh, we'll have a weekend kickball tournament. So just something that makes the company seem more fun and not just all about work because, you know, Gen Y, there's not really a strict line between work and play. They kind of want it to be both. The other thing I would say is that you should definitely make sure that the communication isn't just going well from upper to level divisions, but also across divisions. So the lateral communication should be good as well. And so there should be a basically a, just a large effort around communication, I think would be the, my biggest feedback. That's awesome. There, there's a few blog posts coming on for you, Katie. <laughs> Telling employers what to do. Um, well, uh, we don't have any more questions coming at the moment. We covered most of ours. I think we've gotten a lot of really great information from Katie and Dan today. I want to go back to those one more time to the Gen Y on the Job uh, study that Payscale and Millennial Branding just put out and ask each of you, is there anything that comes to mind from that study that you thought was interesting that we didn't cover uh, yet today or you just want to emphasize there was a lot of information about educational background, job choice, um, where, they tend to, where Gen Y tends to live, uh, tenure. If you would, just take a moment, each of you, if you have anything else that you uh, would like to share or point up to people might be interesting to them. 
Dan, can we start with you? I thought the most interesting piece is that 15% of Gen Y already has manager jobs. I thought that was really interesting. I mean, I don't think it was, was covered that much because it wasn't at the forefront of the study or anything, but I think it's interesting because it's already, you know, they're already starting to get these manager, management jobs, and I mean, it's probably going to double in the next, I don't know, five or so years, so um, it's just going to creep up on us. It's going to move so fast. A million new Gen Yers are added to the workforce every year. Um, and we're just, it's just gonna, it's gonna be interesting to see how it unfolds, but I think a lot of people see, you know, these big corporations with, like, that, like, in Boston, we just have this, this new uh, pharmaceutical company, 1,700 people in one building. I think it's not gonna happen like that in 10 years from now. I think you're not gonna have these huge, huge buildings, I think. I mean, it, you know, the economy has a huge impact. If the economy keeps going, it's getting worse and worse and worse. These companies are not gonna have these big buildings. You look at, you know, later, I don't want to get too off off topic, but you look at it like an Ernst Young, right? And it's all about you show up and you just you know pick a cubicle, but it's more of a consulting company. But you you know, it's not like you're assigned a certain desk every day. I think a lot more companies might adopt something like that, where they have you know a smaller building or several small buildings, and you just go in. And if you need a place to work, it's uh, you know it's it's yours as long as you're an employee. Interesting. Uh, far out thought there. How about you, Katie? What do you want to bring out from this study for the audience? I would agree with Dan that uh, the management factoid is definitely interesting, and I think it shows that if you give Gen Y a chance, they can be hugely successful and a great asset to companies. So hopefully people will see that and give them a little bit more of a chance, because unfortunately the one thing that really sticks out, I think, for me from the study is just the, the level of underemployment that Gen Y is suffering from. You know, I see it in my, my friends from school, and I see it in just people we talk to all the time about how they're really suffering out there, and there's no real bright light in the future even. It's just they're really hurting and it's one of those things that once your career is kind of halted or delayed, it's really hard to come back from it. So they're going to have to be working extra hours, they're going to have to be working probably a much longer into their twilight years than the previous generations to make up for this period of underemployment. Yeah, people who are employed are feeling all these unemployed people because we keep getting resumes. And <laughs> What are you going to do? You know, so I think it, it's less about, you know, submitting a resume and more about, you know, creating, creating projects, doing things, you know, capturing the ROI, turning it into a case study, and then going for the job through a person, through a contact. That's really going to be the way to get jobs. It's going to be walking in. I've done this before. Here the, here's the result. If you hire me, I'll do this for you. Those are the type of conversations that are going to start to happen. Uh, it's, it's scary because a lot of people are not set up for that type of uh, interview process. Yeah, it's interesting. It's sort of that idea of the um, skilled laborer, in a way, is what I'm hearing. Is so you bring your, your skill into the place you say, I can offer you this skill. It's kind of an, it's almost an old fashioned thing. Walk into town and find work. Um, so I would like, if we could, thank you, to thank you both for taking the time today to talk and, if, uh, and share your thoughts on Gen Y. If you would, if you have any last thoughts, um, either of you want to pipe up and just send Gen Y off with uh, a little bit of a, a cheer and good luck <laughs> message, I will hang on for one sec. Yeah, I, I would say that in a world where things are changing so fast and things are so unpredictable, I think in, a, in, in some ways it's exciting, in some ways that you know, at a period like this is where, like, the best companies are built and where, you know, things are just constantly changing. So there are opportunities. You just have to, you know, you know, not rely on anyone or anything and just kind of create your own career path and be accountable for it. That's the, that's the message that I, I'd like to say. Yeah, I would agree and say make sure to be adaptable and uh, don't give up. You know, just keep trying hard and, and use networking, use, th you know, things like LinkedIn or con any other connections you have to really get your foot in the door because putting your resume in through a website is just never going to be seen. So just do everything you can and don't give up. That's the key. I like it. Those are great messages for the big finish. Um, 
as you as we stated, there's a study out, PayScale Millennial Branding just did, Gen Y on the job. Uh, check it out on PayScale.com, and we have some blog posts. Dan's writing about it with a lot of interesting thoughts from him. You can continue to follow him on our the Salary Reporter blog. Over the next few months, he'll be writing more blog posts, um, looking closely at the study, as well as Katie uh, will be contributing her thoughts on our Dr. Salary blog on PayScale. Uh, we enjoy doing G Plus Hangouts here at PayScale. Look forward to more of them in the future. Um, you can look for more of our videos on YouTube. And thank you all for joining us today. Dan and Katie, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.